and we can switch now to S16, which is the task force on uh, creation of uh, a task force on uh, school exclusionary discipline reform. And I imagine that um, the social workers may well want to be hearing about this. <laughs> uh, this is a concern going forward. So um, I will turn to Jay Nichols for a response. Let's do the same three response to uh, S16. Good morning again, everybody. Uh, so this testimony, the last one also included the Vermont Council of Special Education Administrators, as I mentioned in the test in the written testimony. This one, it's uh, it's just VSBA, VPA, and VSA. Joanne has a separate testimony that she's going to share with you after. So thanks for allowing us the opportunity to provide testimony on S16 as passed by the Senate and sent to your committee. Uh, for the record, again, Jay Nichols, VPA Executive Director testifying on behalf of the other associations. Um, additionally, we are sharing with you in written form our previous testimony on S16 in the Senate Education Committee on January 27th, 2021. I sent that to Jesse, so you all should have access to that. We did a very in-depth uh, piece of testimony for Senate education when this bill first came out. Um, our testimony today, though, will be specific to the version of the bill passed in the Senate. So. Bill purpose and findings were supportive of the purpose of the bill. We believe that collecting and analyzing data to drive further actions, plannings, and instructional methodology is something we all value immensely. When we have a more accurate understanding of student discipline data in the state of Vermont, we'll be better poised to use that data to inform decisions. It's really just like reading. You know, we need the data to inform the instruction. Same thing here. Uh, and again, in our original testimony, we, dis we discussed this in depth. In terms of the findings, um, we're not convinced the Vermont student exclusionary data mirrors national data. An accurate, accurate accounting of student discipline data is necessary. We fully support efforts to this end as we have already indicated. Uh, we need to have a really clear understanding of the Vermont data and what that data tells us about our practices in our schools related to student discipline in general and exclusionary practices in particular. And the reason I say this has a lot to do with how this data gets reported. Um, just a quick one minute story. My first year in a system um, that shall not be named uh, as an administrator, <clears throat> I was getting ready to do the end of the year reports. And there was another principal in the system and our two buildings were supposed to do them together because one was middle school, one was high school. And so we sat down together and I had everything in power school all lined up, all my student discipline stuff over the year. And the other administrator came in and he had literally had this folder with a bunch of little sticky notes like this in it. And it said things like, Joe Smith suspended fighting October 3rd. And so we had to go through all that stuff and, and he would have to go by his memory to try to determine, well, that, did he start that fight? Was there bullying involved in that? Was it harassment? It was silly. And I don't know how many places were like that, but I, I question how good the data was. Before she left, um, Amy Fowler uh, was working with me um, at the AOE on trying to make some changes to the collection data system to get more of this aggregated data that, that you folks have uh, in this bill says there's, that you're looking for. Uh, unfortunately, before that got very far, she, she ended up leaving the state and leaving the position. So I support, support that. And I just wanna say, I'm not sure how good the data that we have so far has been. I think it's probably better now than it was a few years ago, but I think we need to make sure we clean that up. We agree with the uh, creation of a council in terms of section two to collect and, and analyze the data. In terms of membership of the council, our organizations will all provide school administrators and other members as appropriate with the development of a school discipline advisory council. Um, in the original section eight, it called for two special education teachers to be appointed by the Vermont Council of Special Educators and no special education administrators. Given the nature of special education law, and the intersection between disciplinary actions and what's called a manifestation determination meetings necessary when disciplinary action is considered for a special education student, we strongly feel that at least one member of the council should be a special education director. You need somebody on the council that understands special education, how that intersects with um, the discipline of students. I think some tightness in this area is worth looking at. Um, we actually like, when I say we, I say, I really mean me, but Jeff and Sue signed off on this. So like the original language, 
around the advisory council makeup that specifies the positions or roles that will make up the school disciplinary advisory council. For example, we, the VPA, uh, was to have two principals, one secondary and one elementary on the council. It might be worthwhile for you to look at that previous language and discuss the value of prescribing the composition of the council. Uh, finally, uh, we've said this many times, we're concerned that the agency of education may not have enough personnel to collect the data that this law will require and be able to share the data with the advisory council in an efficient and effective manner. We continue the worry that the AOE may not have sufficient personnel to participate meaningfully in this process and other tasks, given the increasing number of responsibilities being required of them. That's just a caveat that we're throwing out there. And section six, which is the change um, to the law around 1162, the same rules we believe that apply to public schools and entities should be followed and applied to private schools. Schools still have the latitude to suspend when safety is at concern. This standard should be for all children, A and younger, whether in a public or private school. We respectfully ask that you change the language to say, a student enrolled in a public school or a private school slash program in which the institution is receiving public dollars for all or part of that student's tuition. That would be more consistent with what we've tried to do with special education and other things the last few years. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have at this point or after the other folks that are testifying on this issue are finished. Thank you. Um, Joanne Unruh, did you want to add something to this? Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Um, we wrote for VCSEA, we wrote some separate testimony, not because we had any disagreements with the testimony provided by Jay just now, but um, there were some specific issues that not only impact special education students and Section 504 students, but generally the um, um, what leads to some over identification of students um, in terms of uh, uh, some of the practices that exist around uh, discipline. Um, so we, VCSEA definitely supports the overall purpose of this bill um, and that we really do need to address exclusionary discipline practice. And the use of accurate data provides a foundation to address issues of school climate, supporting students in productive social interactions, and for guiding students and teaching students who are behaviorally challenged in school. It feels like this is a really good step in deepening our understanding of how schools can address the issues of student behavior. Um, and will also help us in terms of strengthening the role of students. Um, the students um, identified um, that appear most frequently in the number of students experiencing exclusionary discipline. Students who, with disabilities, Black and Hispanic students, students from poverty, those all face both implicit and explicit bias in school communities and the broader community. So knowing the numbers and categories of students experiencing disproportionate levels of exclusionary discipline is vital to understanding the scope and nature of the issues. Even though the data is only the first step in identifying the underlying issues. Since Vermont is 95% or 94% uh, white, uh, public reporting for many of these this data that will be collected is going to be very challenging and, and in many cases impossible because the N of 15 required for public reporting just won't be there. However, the whole state level data will be very important in looking at these issues and it will also be useful to the agency of education in monitoring and working with local districts given their access to all of that data. So I think that it remains really important and to echo what, what Jay said, the accuracy in data has um, at least um, at the time that, that um, I was actively working as the um, executive director of, of VCSEA, I mean, there were lots of stories of data not being reported when kids were invited to go home for the afternoon or for a day after some 
apparently egregious event happened, but those were not re reported as suspensions. And I know that some of the data that was relied on for the kick out study um, also had completely missing data from at least one fairly large supervisor union in Vermont. So the, the expectation that schools keep accurate data throughout the year um, is, is a critical step. And I think we'll be, and this bill will help um, that that happen. Um, and I just, given the nature of, of the additional pressures on systems due to COVID, we also know that students who face discrimination by other students and adults in their community often face much greater emotional stressors than those who don't. Student behavior is communication. And an essential question is what are students communicating through their behavior that we might see as inappropriate, but feels to the child to be very appropriate to the circumstance. And just referring back to Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, next to food and shelter, belonging is the deepest need for children. A sense of belonging is critical to freeing energy for learning. Kids do not learn well or effectively if they don't feel like they belong. And there is something um, very deeply concerning about exclusionary discipline that gives a message to students that they do not belong in actual fact. Um, and when students don't feel they belong or are understood, they frequently act out through challenging behaviors or act inwardly through anxiety and depression. Um, so we really need to pay attention to this, particularly given our reintegration with uh, following COVID. Um, and often we misinterpret given our own upbringing and our own sort of belonging to a particular socioeconomic setting, we often misinterpret student behavior. Um, something that might be viewed as defiance or non-compliance may, may actually be a deep sense of anxiety and a lack of knowledge. And the student does not want to identify themselves as stupid. They would much rather crumble up that piece of paper and throw it at somebody. Um, than to be seen as stupid or inadequate. Um, we feel like administrators, teachers, and other school staff need tools to understand what students are trying to communicate. Um, in regard to the presence on the task force, we agree with the, our other organizations that it's very important to consider the inclusion of a special education administrator. As you all know, special education law and section 504 laws are complex, very heavily regulated and have a multi-step process in terms of identifying what needs to happen in terms of discipline. There are behavior, functional behavior assessments, there are behavior support plans, there are manifestation determinations by the team to determine whether there really is a causal connection between the child's uh, behavior and their disability. Um, and these are steps in the process that every special educator or doesn't know intimately. And for the most part, the special ed administrator is in the district, the consultant on those um, and those issues. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, and, and also in terms of defining exclusionary discipline, in which um, includes in school and out of school suspension and expulsion. And restraint is listed as a disciplinary strategy in this bill and also in the Agency of Education's um, guidance during COVID. Um, but we just want to remind everyone that restraint should only be used to maintain the student's safety or the safety of others or to prevent damage and destruction to property and for the briefest period of time needed to assure safety. Given the trauma history of many students, um, restraint must be used with the most caution and in many cases would be contraindicated. If we have students who have been sexually abused or are being sexually abused, students with uh, physical abuse histories, um, restraint would only trigger 
um, a more um, pronounced response and would only add to the conf uh, only add to the confusion and the distress of all who are working. Um, so we applaud this bill for identifying as well that we really need to look at a multi-tiered system of support structures for behavior as well as academics. Social emotional learning is as difficult for some as learning to read is for some. And sometimes those two overlap. So the use of a multi-tiered framework is very important. Um, and it's very important for um, the long-term health of a school community. So the components that need to be there is a leadership team that represents the school community and where the principal particularly is actively engaged as a school leader in this process. And the team must be committed not only to good disciplinary practice, but to long-term improvement of school climate. They must embrace diversity as a strength and foster a deep sense of belonging for all. Um, I want also want to just make sure that the committee will have some time to ask some questions. So I'm, your points I'm are moving, very well. moving through quick. Um, uh, yeah. Thank you, but thanks for pointing that out. Teaching clear expectations in the classroom and the larger school environment is really critical to strengthening the students' commitment and engagement in the school. And then I just want to speak very briefly that the training for staff members um, is, a, is a critical piece. Um, we all come with our own baggage into our jobs and to have the opportunity to both feel supported and to learn new skills, to interact with students who behave in ways um, that we don't fully understand is really very critical. And that includes crisis prevention and de-escalation strategies, life space crisis intervention training, trauma-informed practices, um, and others. Um, and we also need to remember that so many of our children who come into school from areas of poverty, um, it's really clear in some of the research that children really get access to, to language in the ages zero to three. Um, and this makes such a strong case for, uh, in the interest of discipline that we really support preschool education because so many children who receive um, uh, state benefits and live in poverty have much, much less capacity in terms of their language when they come into school. They're, they're, the research is saying that there are tens of thousands of words um, fewer that children from poverty come into the school with. So they need to learn, many of these children need to learn the language of, of using their words in terms of appropriate interaction with peers and with adults uh, rather than um, acting out. And I just wanna say that this is very difficult work for children who are very reactive and acting out and staff needs a tremendous amount of support in order to do this well. And many staff embrace this role. Um, and also there are those who don't be given their, given their own um, limitations. And we also build community through celebrating successes. So if children know and have been modeled and get to practice expectations, they have the opportunity then to also um, be part of celebrations, not only individually, but also in the classroom and the, la the larger school community. And lastly, I, wanted to, I would wanna say is that I would ask you to please avail yourselves um, and for this committee to avail themselves of testimony for, from schools who have successfully implemented a multi-tiered social, emo social emotional learning framework. There are 164 schools in Vermont implementing, for example, positive behavior intervention supports. And other more locally designed frameworks are also successful in some schools. Hearing from these, I think, would be really very important for both you and the, the, the team. And I certainly have some recommendations um, regarding both some schools as well as the PBIS team um, that would really um, augment the, 
the data that you have heard thus far. Sorry, I've spoken so long. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank um, you. I'm making up for lost time, I guess. <laughs> I know, it's been a long time. And, and you've got a lot of these comments in writing and in your written yeah. testimony, I see, which is great. But I wanna get to, it, to the folks' mind, we'll go to Jeff Fannin and then I'll go back to your questions. Okay. Thank so, you. Yeah. Um, Madam Chair, uh, Jeff Fannin, Executive Director of Vermont and EA again. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about uh, S-16 as passed by the Senate. Um, I should have just uh, called Jay earlier and, and uh, ad, requested that my name be added to his, his written testimony. It's, it's good stuff. And he raised some very good points. Um, and I'll just try to echo those or amplify those and, and not be redundant entirely. Um, as for looking at the, the makeup of the, of the uh, task force, which we support, um, and, and let, me, let, me be, let me be very clear, we support S-16, we think it's a good, good bill and needs to be examined and there's good data to be collected and should be collected. Um, in the original, as, as introduced in the Senate, um, it was very specific about who appointed membership to the task force. Um, and we've had a common theme, I'll say this, over this last several years with concerns raised about the, uh, the ability of the AOE to take on more work and the challenges that they have. And so you've left to the secretary, or this, the bill as, as sent over from the Senate leaves the secretary of education um, making the appointments and sort of really driving the ship. And I wonder uh, if that's consistent with the concerns we've raised and several of us, you know, the organizations have raised over the last several years about the putting more work on the back of the AOE. Uh, without resources attached to it. So uh, I do raise that concern and maybe the way to address it is what Jay suggested, which is look back to the as introduced bill and, uh, and look to the appointing uh, organizations that, that can then perhaps help the agency uh, push this along a little bit because it is an important issue to collect the data and, and have the task force look at this information. So support um, maybe looking, examining that. Um, the other uh, piece, I should, again, it's nice to follow smart, good people and articulate people. Joanne just mentioned, I think, maybe not directly, but uh, mentioned professional development for staff. Uh, and that's not, I don't see that in, in, in S16. If I miss it, uh, I, I could be disabused of that, but perhaps we look at review in school services and availability, including professional development for staff. Um, it is important that staff also be trained how to recognize their implicit, in some cases, explicit biases uh, and try to figure out ways to address those. So uh, I will, again, email Jim DeMarais on that. Um, and I'll make my note here. Uh, um, thank you. Um, and if there was one other piece. Um, Oh, uh, Jay's point, well taken is section six of the of the bill, uh, suggesting that this also be applied to private schools and pre-K uh, programs. So um, I think that's a good catch and I support that. With that said, we support S-16 uh, with some modest adjustments perhaps uh, and have it take questions. And I know that there are questions already. Yes, there, there are. Thank you. And if you, you all could sort of organize those into a, a list for me, that would be great. Um, Represent, I'm going to actually jump for a minute and go to Representative Brady because she's been following this the most, if you don't mind. And she's also got a child at home. So <laughs> Representative Brady. Thank you. Yes, I got some threw some goldfish at my second grader for a few minutes here. Um, I want to go actually exactly to what you just raised, Jeff, and which is the professional development piece. And it's also in, um, in the testimony here from Joanne, point number three, administrators, teachers, and other school staff need tools and strategies to understand. Um, and, and that's my concern is I support this 10,000%, the spirit of it, but how do we make it actually work? It's one thing to tell schools don't, don't kick kids out. My heart sinks when I get the email that so-and-so will be out for three days and then back in the planning room for two days, please send down a packet. Um, Cause I know that kid is now just gonna be further and further behind and was often behind before that. Uh, but I, I'm worried that nothing in the bill right now really gets at 
how do what how do we do it better? How do we how do we do those supports in schools? How are administrators and administrative teams prepared, and how are teachers prepared? I, I mean, I, I don't think high school teachers get really any <laughs> training, truthfully, around um, discipline. As schools become more trauma informed, it's becoming part of the ethos. But uh, but I don't think it's you know at the higher levels even something that's routine in, in teacher development. Um, but schools are pulled a lot of directions right now. So I'm concerned about, I wanna do this, but do it well. Um, so how, what, what do we need? How can we do that so that we aren't telling schools what they can't do, but they aren't set up with the tools for what they need to do. And I'm not sure how much of that is legislation, how much of that is outside of our purview, but I, I really appreciate the point you're raising, Jeff. Thank you. Um, Representative Conlon and then Austin. Uh, thanks. Very quickly, uh, Section 6, which is uh, which Jay had commented on about needing to expand that to private schools. Uh, while Jeff said, including pre-K, I don't think I heard you say including private pre-K. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to sort of know kind of where your comments began and ended on that. Yeah, um, definitely including private pre-K. Absolutely. It needs to be that, saying that the same for all Vermont kids that are receiving any public funding to support their school experience. Okay, thank you. Thank you for asking that. Okay, Representative Austin. Yes, um, thank you. Um, when I, you know, read this uh, section, I am concerned about the title of it because I don't believe that. Um, excluding a child, at least in my experience, you know, in the public schools, uh, excluding a child wasn't a form of discipline. Uh, excluding a child was to try to figure out a plan in how to um, give, the, give students and teachers uh, the skills and knowledge they need to remain in the classroom. It, it was devastating, you know, the educators I work with to take any child out of a classroom and deny them access to their education was pretty devastating. I mean, it is a last resort. And usually it was like Jay said, a question of safety to themselves or to other students or that their behaviors, and I believe, and maybe Joanne would agree, it was because they don't have the skills, you know, that they need, we need to understand the behavior and talk to them but they also need to learn the skills to be able to um, regulate their emotions and remain in a classroom. But um, the, the other reason I think uh, kids had to leave the classroom was because they were their behavior was getting in the way of other kids being able to access their education as well, but it was never used as discipline. I mean, to think that taking a child out of school and putting them at home is gonna teach them how to uh, be back, you know, be able to be in a classroom to me is just so I kind of think of it looking at exclusionary practices you know that's my concern but it, I don't know where discipline fits in there because I've never seen it used as a discipline that it's going to change their behavior so they can re-enter school so that to me that's a little disingenuous and um, I, I totally appreciated Joanne's testimony. I, I, I align with everything she said in terms of understanding their behavior, teacher training. But again, you know, I look at it as skills, basically, you know, what skills does that student need to acquire to be in the classroom? Um, so, um, you know, I, I just want, again, like with literacy, I just want to do what works. I want to look at what's evidence-based, what practices are being used in terms of, you know, students that don't have the ability to regulate their emotions or focus or um, sustain uh, attention in the classroom? And how do we help them? You know, what, what do we do? But I, I just want it to be what works. So who's, whatever comes out of this council, mm -hmm. I'm just hoping they'll look at, you know, really good data in terms of what practices and methods work uh, to address this issue. Because no, no educator I knew ever wanted to take a kid um, away from their learning. So the only thing I can add to what you just said or just offer 
is that um, the PBIS team that works through UVM with education dollars, they've been working since 2008. And, and now there are 164 schools that are involved in this process, but there is a framework um, and working with students at the universal level, like it is for literacy and reading is so remains critical as you're saying, you know, teachers for the most part do not want kids to leave the classroom um, if possible. And they want their students' privacy to be, be supported. And I think getting some testimony from the experience of that framework and other public school frameworks where there has been success, I think would be very helpful to the work on this from this committee or task force. We will have an opportunity uh, to look at this task force and see if there are areas that we might want to change um, to, to amend. Uh, I appreciate we've got some experience in the committee in this area between a guidance counselor, a special educator, and a high school teacher, um, as well as everybody else. Uh, I think that we, we have a, a real interest in doing something about this. Um, Appreciate you, your testimony, um, and uh, we will. We, the any ways that we amend this bill will be on our website. So, thank you. And with that, thank you. We will break for lunch. Um, I the language is getting worked out in the Senate bill. I mean, in the in the Appropriations Committee that we talked about. They are working on that and um, we'll see what's going to happen.